Back in the early 2000s, I was introduced to some of my most cherished video game franchises such as Spyro the Dragon and my all-time favourite, Sonic the Hedgehog. But I still remember that one fateful day. When I was around 5 or 6 years old, my brother comes over and lets me play on his Game Boy Advance with a little game called Pokemon Ruby. It was unlike anything I'd seen before. The wide open worlds, the awesome to just plain weird monster designs, and best of all, it was on the go. I loved the game so much that I actually got it for myself shortly after. I can safely say that if it wasn't for the Pokemon franchise, my love for video games wouldn't be as strong as it is now. And this was before Sonic the Hedgehog made a major impact on my life. To celebrate my 18th birthday and my first official step into adulthood, we're going to take a look back at the games that shaped my childhood. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Pokemon Retrospective. Back in 1996, a man by the name of Satoshi Chijiri wanted to make a game designed around collecting bugs and other insects due to his fascination of different creatures as a child. This concept would later be put to use in what gamers know today as Pocket Monsters in Japan and Pokemon everywhere else. Originally, Pokemon made its debut in February of 1996 with Pokemon Red and Green. By the way, that's over 20 years ago. Yeah, feel old yet. The games were a massive hit, though they did sport various technical issues. The game would then make its way overseas with an updated version called Pokemon Red and Blue, which fixed all the bugs found in the initial versions. The Japanese market would later get the international release with their own version of Pokemon Blue. There was also another version of the game titled Pokemon Yellow, which tried to tie itself in with the anime by making you start off with a Pikachu, and letting you have access to all three starters. What's with all the different versions? Well, I'll explain that in a bit. Whatever version of the game you choose to play, it'll always start out the same way. You'll be greeted by Professor Oak, who will ask you your name, and then he'll ask you the name of his grandson. And you can call him anything you want. That sort of made me laugh. Professor Oak knows pretty much everything there is to know about Pokemon, yet he doesn't even know the name of his own grandson. That he literally lives a few feet away from. Before you have a chance to go in the tall grass, Professor Oak will tell you that it's too dangerous and insists that you come to his lab to get a Pokemon. It's here where you have to make one of your most important life choices. Do you want Bulbasaur, a grass type Pokemon, Squirtle, a water type, or Charmander, a fire type? Regardless of which starter you choose to go with, your rival will always take the Pokemon that's strongest against yours. Now, usually I wouldn't explain all the fundamentals of this sort of game, but because Pokemon is very likely to be somebody's first RPG, as it was mine, I think it's necessary in this case. Each Pokemon has four moves they can use, which can range from offensive to defensive. Different Pokemon belong to certain typing groups, and each of them have their own strengths and weaknesses. For example, a grass type like Bulbasaur is weak against a fire type like Charmander, who's weak to a water type like Squirrel, and so on. There are even more Pokemon types, such as Normal, Flying, Electric, Rock, Ground, Psychic, Ghost, Poison, Ice, Fighting, and finally Dragon. Figuring out what type is strong against another is the game's way of encouraging you to experiment and use different Pokemon. It's something I always enjoy doing whenever a new game comes out, so I'll let you figure this stuff out for yourself. While Pokemon themselves are tied to a certain type, they can still learn moves of a different types if the move is applicable. The easiest way you can do this is by using a TM, which you get from various NPCs. There are also HM moves like Surf or Cut, which you can use outside a battle to progress further through the overworld. However, in order to use these, you'll need to beat the correct Gym Leader. Gym Leaders are basically your bosses for this game, as their Pokemon are a much higher level than your average trainer. Fortunately for you, each Gym Leader only specialises in one type of Pokemon, so basically it's just a game of find their weakness and exploit it. The Gym Badges are actually something that I really like. They're like little milestones to show me how far away I am from completing my journey. I say that because I've found in other RPGs, I don't really get a sense of how far away I am from the end. That's not really a criticism though, complaining about an RPG being long is like complaining Clara is hot, well of course, what were you expecting? I just like the inclusion of the gym badges is all. However, you're probably not going to get to the Elite Four with that one measly starter Pokemon, unless you're doing a Nuzlocke run, but that's a 
another thing entirely. You can have up to six different Pokemon on your team at a time. Any extra you catch will go straight to your PC, where you can easily switch out your Pokemon if need be. You encounter a Pokemon by walking into different places, like some tall grass or inside a cave. From there, you can attempt to capture said Pokemon with a Pokeball. You can increase your chances by lowering the Pokemon's HP or by giving them status ailments such as burn, poison, and sleep, just to name a few. Because of how many Pokemon there are, the team you choose to tackle the rest of the game with is going to be much more diverse than any other RPG you'll ever play. Nothing against games like Final Fantasy or Earthbound, they're good games and I enjoy them, I just like how I'm given a choice as to who I want my party members to be. Put it this way, there are 150 Pokemon, 151 if you count Mew, and you're allowed 6 Pokemon on your team at a time. I doubt any team is going to be the same on each subsequent playthrough. And in the context of present day, there are almost as many Pokemon as there are episodes of the anime. No, I'm not joking. When a Pokemon reaches a certain level, they'll begin to evolve into a much more powerful Pokemon, like Charmander into Charmeleon and finally into Charizard. However, some Pokemon evolve when different requirements are met, such as using a Thunderstone to evolve or Pikachu into Raichu, or by trading Kadabra to get Alakazam. Nowadays, you can battle and trade with your friends wirelessly. Back then, however, you had to rely on link cables. Yeah, remember those? If you plan on catching them all, you'll need both red and blue versions of the game and somebody to trade with, as each version has their own exclusive Pokemon. I tried to do this once on my Pokemon Black save file, but I gave up. For me, Pokemon games were all about experimentation with different team combinations and competing against other people. If you really want that certificate, you go right ahead, I'm not stopping you. Other than your rival and gym leaders, you'll also come across Team Rocket on your travels, who are nothing more than petty thieves. They say they're going to take over the world, but they're not doing a very good job if a small 10 year old boy who just left home can stop them. Mind you, the police force aren't any better. These douchebags literally won't allow me to progress until I give them something to drink. In fact, being thirsty is a running theme in this game. This old man will occupy the walkway to Pewter City just because he hasn't had his coffee yet. Seems legit. I have to say though, while I find Team Rocket as a crime organisation to be very forgettable, I do really like the twists surrounding their boss, Giovanni, who throughout the course of the game just sees Pokemon as tools for battling. Previously, the gym in Viridian City was closed because the gym leader was away. When you gather 7 of the 8 gym badges, the gym will finally reopen, revealing that the gym leader is none other than Giovanni. After beating him, he discovers the thrill of Pokemon battling and decides to disband from Team Rocket to become a better trainer. I'm not expecting a main series Pokemon game to have a deep story. I'll play Mystery Dungeon if I want a compelling storyline, but I do appreciate little things like this. It's a shame that Game Freak didn't really try to do something like this again until Pokemon Black and White, but I'll sing that game's praises when the time comes. Once you've collected all 8 gym badges, you can now enter the Pokemon League, where some of the toughest trainers in all of Kanto await you, also known as the Elite Four. In earlier parts of the game, you could always head back to the Pokemon Center if you ever needed to heal your Pokemon. But not here. You're in the big leagues now, which means you have to endure all four trainers in one big succession if you want to be given the type of Pokemon Champion. Fortunately, you are allowed to use healing items in between each battle though, so it's not that bad. You have my undying respect if you can manage to beat them without using them. I think type-specific gym leaders are a good way of teaching the player about super effective attacks. But by the time you get to the Elite Four, I think they really should have changed it up a bit. This is supposed to be the final hurdle, yet I only seem to rely on one or two Pokemon for each battle. I should stress that on your first playthrough, the Elite Four are probably going to give you a lot of shit. But on repeated playthroughs, I began to grow tired of knocking these guys down without any hassle. Like most things in life though, it's never that easy, as you discover that your rival managed to beat the Elite Four mere minutes before you did. Again, I like this twist, as throughout your adventure, your rival has always been bragging about being one step ahead for you. So it feels great to finally knock him down a peg. It's a climactic final battle and a very satisfying one at that. I really enjoy this game's presentation. Locations such as Pokemon Mansion and Lavender Town have a very chilling atmosphere thanks to the fantastic soundtrack. I feel perfectly justified in saying that this is one of my favourite soundtracks in the series. Special mentions go to Route 1 and the awesome Gym Leader music. I like the graphics outside of the Pokemon sprites. I get it guys, this was their first game, but seriously, some of these sprites are really ugly compared to their official concept art. And Wigglytuff, Jesus Christ that sprite 
sprite is the stuff of nightmares. Thankfully, Pokemon Yellow featured completely redrawn sprites, so props to the Yellow version. The Pokemon roster for this generation is decent, though it doesn't really do much for me. Though I get that's more out of personal preference, so I'm not going to hold that against the game. Even still, this generation is home to some of my personal favourites, such as Venusaur, Jolteon, Lapras and Gengar, so I can't really complain too much. What I do have a problem with though is the game's arcade design choices. For starters, let's talk about the PC storage system. If you catch a Pokemon and you already have 6 Pokemon in your party, it will be sent to the PC storage system. That much is fine, however the PC also has 10 different boxes that get full over time. You would think when a box gets full it would just transfer the Pokemon to the next available box. <laughs> I wish. Instead, you have to manually switch boxes, because if you don't do that, the Pokemon you just caught, gone. And if you're going for any of the special legendary Pokemon like the Bird Trio or God Help You Mewtwo, then that can be a serious flick in the nuts. I have a similar problem with the bag, as every item is put in one pocket, making it incredibly disorganised. Furthermore, your bag gets full really quickly, and if there's no Pokemon Center around for you to store your items in, you either have to throw one of your items away to get the one that you want, or come back for it later. The Safari Zone is the best example to demonstrate my point, as you can only take a certain amount of steps. So if you want to get all the items, I seriously hope you remember to clean your bag up before doing so. Yes, I know many people are not going to care about a random potion lying around on the ground, but it's a different story when it's an Earthquake TM. Hey, you just never know what's going to be in those poke walls. What about the battle mechanics? Surely I can't find fault with them. They built the foundations for the rest of the series. That is true, and to a certain extent the game is still plenty functional. There are, however, some glaring issues that could have been avoided first game or not. For starters, your special attack and special defense are put into one single special stat. This means that a Pokemon with a high special stat can not only dish out some damage, but can also take hits like a tank as well. That's if you're dealing with special moves, of course. And for every generation up to Gen 3, whether a move had physical or special properties wasn't determined by the nature of the move. Instead, certain types like fire were special, and certain types were physical, like fighting. This means that you could potentially have a move like Fire Punch, which should be physical, turn out to be special. The unfortunate consequence of this is that a select few types are incredibly unbalanced, and by that I mean the psychic type. So what's the big deal? Just get a Pokemon that's strong against psychic types. Yeah, see that's the thing. The only types of Pokemon that are strong against psychic types are ghosts, in which there are only one of them and there aren't even any ghost type moves, and bug types who are incredibly underutilized in this generation. Seriously, don't use them. At least not until Gen 2 anyway. Like it or not, for a game centered around competitive play with friends, having a clear cut best type is not good game design. And I'm not done yet either. Some Sometimes, during a battle, a Pokemon may inflict double damage by getting a critical hit. In Generation 1, critical hits are not random, at least somewhat anyway. Instead, they're judged based on the user's speed. This means that you could potentially have cases like Venusaur's Razor Leaf that are guaranteed critical hits. I shouldn't have to explain why this is broken. Lingering attacks like Fire Spin will continue to inflict little bits of damage to the opposing Pokemon until it wears off. During this time, nor you or your opponent can do anything, completely breaking the flow of battle, something that could be devastating for a handheld RPG. Look, let me be honest with you, I don't consider this to be a bad game, nor do I hate it. In fact, I don't think there is such thing as a bad generation of Pokemon in my eyes. I wanted to review this game and the entire series not to attack a beloved game that everybody loves, but just to get people to look at these games from a different perspective. Pokemon since its debut has received nothing but refinement through each installment. There are people who will look at you straight faced and say that Gen 1 is the best game in the series, and that's fine, I haven't got a problem with that. What ticks me off is when people get the classic Sonic complex of every subsequent game sucks in comparison. I see a lot of people hating on Gens 5 and 6 in particular, and I have no idea why. Is it really a bad thing for me to say that the the first game of the series is my least favourite. Surely that should tell you that the games that come after that are nothing but an improvement. And isn't that what you want from a franchise that you love? Regardless, I still think this game is perfectly playable, I just think you have better options, that's all. If you love the game, more power to you, I do too. I just get sick of people treating it like the god of all games, when it really isn't.
This is why I would recommend Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, released in 2004 as a remake of Pokemon Red and Blue. Due to this game being released around the time of Generation 3, the battle mechanics have been updated to feature all the additions from those games. I'll discuss the tweaks when we get to Generation 3. All you need to know is, those issues that I've mentioned earlier, completely null and void. Game Freak even added in a few extras, namely the Sevi Islands, which actually bridges the gap between the story of this game and the second generation. You infiltrate Team Rocket's secret headquarters where you find out about their next scheme, consisting of forcing Pokemon to evolve. You also discover that Giovanni actually has a son, who will be a prominent part of Generation 2. One more thing, I mentioned that in any generation before Generation 4, players would have to use link cables if they wanted to play with their friends. Well, that's only half right, as Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green came with wireless adapters that you plugged into the back of your Game Boy Advance. The thing is, I never used them and I've since lost my wireless adapters so I can't really give a fair judgement on how well they work. Feel free to tell me down in the comments below though, I'd love to find out. With this enhanced remake, I see no reason why anyone in this day and age would want to go back to the original game other than nostalgia and to see how the series made a name for itself. No disrespect to the original version or anybody that likes it, I just find it a bit archaic is all. Tune in next time where we travel through a whole new world with Pokemon Generation 2.